Good morning. I want to worship today at Abiding Word. Special welcome to our guests and visitors who are with us uh, this Sunday. Our uh, theme for worship uh, today is Christ's warnings count the cost. Uh, the last few weeks we've been looking at the, the different uh, uh, words of our Savior to his disciples, to his followers, words that uh, still apply to us. And this morning uh, in the gospel lesson, Jesus encourages us to count the cost of following him. And as he, he does that, uh, he also reminds us of the great cost that he paid for us, the cost of our salvation. He gave his life so that we could have eternal life with him in heaven. And that gospel, that, that love of our Savior, compels us to serve him with everything we have because he is our Savior. Well, follow the order of worship uh, this morning uh, in your service folders and, and your uh, red pew hymnals and on the screen in front of you. And I also would invite you at some point to please uh, take a minute, fill out that connection card, place that in the offering plate uh, uh, this morning. So with that introduction, we will begin our worship then with our opening hymn number 428, Why Should Cross and Trial Grief. <laughs> stand. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve Him. 
as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and ask him to forgive us. Merciful Father in heaven, I confess that I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child, and may God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of our forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We will sing verse 1 and 3 of the hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church, and because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson for this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 12. This is God's call to Abraham to go to the promised land of Canaan. We see Abraham respond in faith, and we see Abraham respond with worship as he considers how God keeps his promises. Genesis, chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. 
Our psalm of the day is Psalm 19. You'll find that on the screen or in your red pew hymnals or in your service folder. Our psalm this morning, our soloist will sing the, uh, the odd verses of the psalm. The congregation is invited to re- the refrain and the glory be the Father as well as the even. Today's second lesson, taken from the book of Philemon. Here the Apostle Paul encourages Philemon as Paul is sending Philemon's servant back to him, a man by the name of Onesimus, uh, that Philemon would receive him and and welcome him. And Paul expresses a confidence that comes from the gospel, of confidence of of God's people responding in in faith. Philemon chapter 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend, and fellow worker, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrongs or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention 
that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. This is the word of the Lord. Our verse of the day is from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. Alleluia. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson from Luke chapter 14 will also serve as the basis of Pastor Schoen's sermon this morning. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation, while the other is still a long way off and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated. This time I'm going to invite our children to come forward for children's lessons. Good to see everybody today. Morning. Got something here I want to show you, uh, and uh, I'll tell you what they are, and I'm going to need you to help me read them, okay? All right. These are, are little, that's a little magnet on the back of there, and we stick these up on a, uh, a uh, bulletin board in our house, and it's our chore chart. These are the chores that the children in my home have to do, some of them. I didn't bring all of them because there's a whole lot of chores. Anybody got chores they got to do at home? You have any, no chores for you? That's a, I mean, what a life, man. That's great. <laughs> I bet you got a couple. We'll talk about it. I'll ask your mama. Uh, so who, uh, this is one chore. Uh, chore, can you read what that says? Laundry duty. Anybody have laundry duty at home? Yeah, what does that mean? You gotta, Jacob, you got to pick up your dirty clothes, right? Put them in the laundry. Okay, that's one. What's this one say, Eli? Can you read that? We got that. John, what does that say? Dust house. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? You got to get all the dust out of the house. Here's uh, Alex. That's probably your favorite, right? Yeah. Can you read it out loud? Clean room. Did Did you hear that, Mrs. Mitby? That's his favorite. Clean room. And this is somebody. Make dinner. We've got another one here. Yeah, let me this one. This is one pick up, right? And if you got a dog, we got two dogs. This one says pick up something. I got it covered up by my thumb. Well, I won't show you what that says underneath there, but you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Pick up. So you got we all got all got chores at home. Why do you do your chores? Why do you do your chores? What do you think, Alex? Why do you God wants you to, right? Oh, that's the answer, right? It's part of a family, right? There's just things we do as, as family. And as, as a Christian, we do it because God wants us to. But you know else why we do it? Because of what God did for us. Jesus had a big chore. And his chore was to come into this world to be our Savior. To live and die and rise again. He did that for each of us because there are times we don't always do our chores. And sometimes our attitudes aren't very good when we're asked to do chores. That's not just young people, it's for older people too. We always, aren't always joyful, right? But Jesus came to forgive us for those sins and he did it. He gives us forgiveness and 
somehow we look at what God calls us to do, and it's not hard, it's not a burden. It's a joy because we're always seeing Jesus. And so as you do your chores at home or as you go to school and, and uh, listen to your teachers or kind of your classmates, whatever the circumstance, we can do everything with joy because of how Jesus served us. Let's go to the prayer and ask him to help us do that, okay? Dear Jesus, we thank you for being our Savior, for coming to this world to, to serve us by dying for us. Thank you for that forgiveness and let it encourage us to serve you and the people that you brought into our lives. Help us to do that. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can return to your parents. Continue our service with our hymn of the day. It's printed on the screen or an insert, O Christ, who called the twelve. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you are just thrilled and, and love to plan things? Anyone here a planner? You would consider yourself a planner? Few of you, nice, I like it. 
I'm raising my hand just so you don't feel alone. However, I do not enjoy planning uh, to the bane and frustration of my wife, Mari. You can ask her. I, I just, I'd rather just wing it. It'd be more fun in my, in my life. But, but planning is important, isn't it? You planners know that. Even us non-planners know that, don't we? That it's important to plan things. You can't just go through life kind of riding the waves and see what happens especially because there's important things that need to get done. So, uh, for example, you plan when you buy a house, don't you? You kind of need to have all your things in order. You need to know if you have the right budget, what you need to cut out. If you can't go out to eat as much, if maybe you have to trade in some things, whatever it may be, you plan and make those cuts. Or if you're going to get married and you're, you're thinking about it, you need to plan and sit down and consider your, your spouse, what you're getting into, uh, if this is the qualities that you want, you need to know all those things because that's a big commitment that you don't just want to consider as willy-nilly. If you're going to school, maybe college, a degree, you need to consider very, very thoroughly what you want to do with your life, how you want to serve God, the cost of that school versus the output and all those types of things. It's important to sit down and plan. And sometimes it's just as important to sit down and plan your day-to-day -day life. We know those things, even us non-planners. question for you today, besides that, is how often do you sit down and consider, uh, like you do with those big monumental things, uh, you're calling to Christ? Do you consider the cost that, that he has for you? Do you consider what it means to be a disciple of Jesus? Is that part of your day-to-day -day routine? If not... Today, your Savior comes to you and tells you that, to consider the cost of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And he does so as he's on his way to Jerusalem. After Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. He's on a mission to get there, to die, to pay for the sins of the whole world. And as he does so, he starts coming and teaching some very tough and confusing and, and and interesting things that make everyone who hears it stop and wonder, what are you exactly saying, Jesus? But that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to stop and consider what he's saying. Because it's very important. Very important as we consider the cost of being a follower of Christ. Today is no different. Now Jesus on his way and in his earthly ministry, there's times where he wasn't as popular. There's times when he was very popular. This is one of those times where there were large crowds as he was teaching like no one else, teaching with authority, teaching with power, talking about God's love and forgiveness and how the kingdom of heaven is open to everyone, and yet still at the same time calling out hypocrisy and moralism and, and pointing everyone to what the true following of Christ is and following of God. He did miracles that just flabbergasted people. They, they saw him still storms, his disciples. They saw him feed thousands with just a few loaves, Imagine being there watching Jesus as he, he called out a spirit, uh, a demon from someone who, in whom they were possessed, right? And you see that power, and you think, I want to be following this guy. So there they are. And imagine you're one of them. At that moment, as we heard Pastor Brown read it, and I'll read it in a few moments again, there you are with that large crowd, and you can see Jesus talking maybe cordially with the people right up the front as he's walking towards on his way to Jerusalem, right? And then he stops. And you get excited. What's this guy going to say? What's this famous rabbi going to teach you today? And, and listen to the words he has for you. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Maybe that's not what you were expecting if you were part of that crowd to hear this great rabbi say. Because he lays some pretty important, pretty powerful words before us. Did you catch it? He says, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sister, your very life, your own self, if you don't hate that, you can't be my disciple. And when I say the word, or when he says the word hate, what does that mean? Well, I asked our 7th and 8th grade in catechism class, I brought this up as we were doing our opening devotion, and I said, what do you think Jesus means when he says the word hate? What does hate mean? 
And they answered, well, ill will towards someone, loathing them, despising them, wanting nothing to do with them. And they were right. When Jesus says hate, he means hate. He doesn't mean love your family just a little bit less and then, and then love Jesus just a little bit more. He doesn't mean love yourself just a little bit less and just, just drop it a few notches and then love Jesus just a few notches above. No, he says, hey, have nothing to do with it. Which maybe makes you stop and scratch your head because you go, it, well, Jesus, isn't there a commandment kind of about this? Honor your father and mother that it should go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Don't you tell me that, that I should love my neighbor as myself? Don't you say that I should even love my enemies? But now you're telling me to hate my family, hate my closest connections, hate even myself, my aspirations, my dreams, everything I want for this earthly life. And the answer is yes. To consider the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. And he explains it with a couple parables that we are, we are pretty familiar with and easy to understand. He talks about a guy who's building a tower, and if you're going to build a tower, what do you need to do first? You need, first need to figure out your budget, then you can find out what the size of the tower you can build. Otherwise, if you just went ahead with it and said, I want to build this tower, what is, what is everyone going to do? It's half built, you're going to walk by, you're going to see your friend's half built tower, and you're going to go, what a fool. What a fool. He didn't even think about it. What was he thinking? Obviously nothing. Same thing with a, a king who's going to war, right? 10,000 versus 20,000 doesn't seem very good if you've ever played sports or maybe with getting clients at work, whatever it may be. You, you know your advantages and disadvantages, and if it seems like you can't win, you're not really going to play that game or go after that client until you have the advantage, right? You sit down and you consider what it takes before you go out and do it you get what Jesus is saying? This whole following him, being his disciple, is not something that you can do half-hearted, just on a whim. But he wants you to consider what it costs to follow him. It means to give up your closest connections. To give up your very dreams and hopes. To pick up a cross, an instrument of death, and follow him. And then he totals it all up and says, and if you can't give up everything that you have. You cannot be my disciple. Big words, isn't it? Big cost. Have you considered? For example, if, if God would to come to you today before you and stand there and say, give up everything you have and follow me, would you be happy and joyful to do it? I thought about that question in preparation for this sermon, and, and as I was considering it, there was kind of this pit that began to form in my stomach. I don't know if it's ever happened to you like that. When you hear this, this great big call that Jesus has, give up everything, hate it all, and follow me. And why is that pit forming? Because part of me, yes, I know I want to do what Jesus says, but, but part of me says, I don't know if I can I don't know if I could give up my family or my, my closest connections, my own dreams or all that I own to follow Jesus. Part of me knows that what he's saying is impossible. Maybe, maybe you do too, as you consider that. And as you think about the cost of what Jesus is saying, that total cost, give up everything and follow him, it's not just a personal level of you giving up your closest connections or your aspirations, whatever it may be. It also can affect us as a church. Today, we are celebrating joyfully and thankfully and to the glory of God 50 years of gospel ministry in this little corner of his kingdom. But the temptation that the devil wants us to, to bite into and to fall for is that it's only about this building and that it's about our history and the ways that we have to do things. We need to protect that instead of seeing the greater picture, sacrificing our wants for the cost of following Christ. And it can maybe get us a little uptight, scrunch our face in disgust and say, Jesus, I don't, I don't know. But that's why Jesus is saying this to us, with these words that kind of strike a chord in our heart, to get us to consider the cost. 
And maybe there's another way that you're looking at it. Maybe you know all that. You know that it costs a lot. And maybe you leave here Sunday, not, not turning it off and saying, well, I'm all in on Sundays and then all out on the week. That might not be you at all. Maybe you live a, a quiet life. You, you leave here and you're wondering each and every day, if God were to come before me today and say, follow me, give it all up, did you do enough? Would I be able to answer that and say yes? And it leaves us in that desperation, wanting and desiring to serve our God, to do everything we need, but doubting that we are up to the task. And as we feel that way and, and think those thoughts and slip into that quiet life of desperation, what, what do these words do? Well, they drive us to the one speaking them. Because Jesus knows what he asks is impossible for us to do alone. But that's the whole reason why he came, isn't it? He says, consider the cost, but don't worry, Jesus, your Savior, has considered a greater cost, hasn't he? From the moment God created this world, he plunged his hands into the depths uh, and the dirt and the mud and formed two human beings from the moment that Adam and Eve didn't consider the words that the devil was saying to them and they wanted to be their own God and rebelled against God. Jesus knew the cost would be great. And as he considered the, the glories of heaven. He was in perfect harmony with the angels and they were praising to him, perfect harmony with himself. And, and there's the eternal heaven and the eternal glories. He knew he had it. And yet he considered you. And he exchanged all that for angry mocks and jeers and insults. He considered himself uh, in the praise as he's seated on his throne and the angels are surrounding him and he exchanged it for a cross to be surrounded by a bunch of unbelievers who mocked and jeered him. He considered that it would be his very life, hell, suffering hell itself, to save you. But he did so willingly. And he gave it all up, suffered it all, paid the price because he wanted you. You are his treasure. And when you consider the cost, as Jesus says, hate your life, hate yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, this impossible demand, what we need to do is to consider the cost of being a follower of Christ in the light of Christ, don't we? Because when you see how much Jesus gave up for you, how much he loves you and willingly went to suffer for you, to die for you, to rise for you, to redeem you, it changes everything. When he says, give up your life, Give up your family. Give up everything you have. When you're considering that in the light of Christ, what does that do? Well, well, I can give up my closest connections because I'm at peace with God. I can give up all my hopes and aspirations and dreams because God has given me a certain eternal hope. I can give up all my possessions because I have the riches of heaven at my disposal. It changes everything. And it changes us as a congregation, too, to, to not just be so worried about protecting a building or, or focused on a location, but, but it helps us get our minds out, away from us. And to those who, who are wondering those same thoughts that you are, have I done enough? If, if God would come to me today, would he find me ready and willing? Would he find me wanting? And it gets us to go out there and consider them for whom Jesus died as well. And as we do so, as we consider this great cost of being a follower of Christ, as we struggle with wrestling with this, because we know we will, I'm going to give you a tool, a tool to go back to. It's a, a famous hymn uh, written by a guy named Paul Gerhard. He, was, he lived in the 1600s. And the first line of the hymn is definitely based off Isaiah 53. It's hymn 100. A lamb goes uncomplaining forth. You guys know that one a little bit? You guys know that one a little bit? As you consider the cost of following Christ, it's big, it's great, it can leave us uh, maybe a little despairing, but no, this hymn is in there too, based on Isaiah. This shows the heart of God for you. Turn in your red hymnals. They're in the front of the pew. Take them out and uh, turn to hymn 100, big 100 in the corner there. I'm going to read the first verse. During the offering, we're going to listen to a familiar hymn, Jesus Loves Me, beautifully played. As you listen to that, that hymn um, and you have these words in front of you, just think about God's love, the cost that he willingly gave for you without complaint. I'm going to read this first verse because I think it's beautiful. It's been on my mind uh, ever since a pastor was installed a few weeks ago in A-Leaf, 
down at Christ the Lord. They played this song to a different melody. Paul Gerhardt uh, wrote this, like I said, and he says, A lamb goes uncomplaining forth, our guilt and evil bearing, and laden with the sins of earth, none else the burden sharing, goes patient on, grows weak and faint, to slaughter led without complaint, that spotless life to offer, bear shame and stripes and wounds and death, anguish and mockery and says, willing all this I suffer. As we consider the cost, consider it in that. Look at what your Savior has given for you. Look at what your Savior says about you. Look at what your Savior desires. It's you. And rest on that unlimited love, that unlimited forgiveness, that unlimited grace that He continues to daily give to you until that cost is met. Right? And we're with him in heaven when where we see the reward that Jesus paid us with him forever. And dear friends, that's the cost, that's the reward. And that's your Savior's heart for you. Amen. Please stand and join with me as we consider our and confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find that on the screen, or you can follow along on page 8 in your worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. At this time we take our offering out of thanksgiving to our Lord. This would be a good opportunity to put that connection card in the offering plate as well. Continue our worship with prayer. Uh, one special prayer request this morning on behalf of uh, Shelby Clark. Uh, Shelby's going to be having some surgery this week, so we keep her in our prayers uh, as we go before our God today. Please stand for prayer.
Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are always on the righteous and ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies you pour down on us anew each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, O Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being, and are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may produce fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith that we might always be ready to do your will. We pray for the nations of the earth, subdue tear and tyranny everywhere, and call forth leaders who acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own land. May it ever follow that which is good and turn from all that which is wicked, that our people may prosper in uprightness and integrity. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for those who are afflicted. Grant them health in body and soul and save them for your mercy's sake. We pray this morning on behalf of Shelby Clark, who's going to be undergoing surgery this week. As you promise to be with your people in all circumstances of life, remind Shelby of that promise and assure her that you are with her always. Grant success to the surgery as it pleases you. Give wisdom to the doctors and nurses. Be with Shelby as she requires, uh, re recovers and fill her with the thankfulness for all the blessings you've given her in Jesus, her Savior. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Guide and uphold us during our pilgrimage in this world and bring us all to our heavenly home. Receive these petitions in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Continue with our next hymn, Be Still, My Soul.
O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you this favor and give you his peace. Amen. We join our final hymn, Let Me Be Yours Forever. again welcome joy to worship with you this morning special welcome our guests and visitors who are with us this sunday I have a number